Okay, well, good morning. We understand it is spring break, so some people are headed off on their travels for spring break, but we're glad that you joined us today after that very meaningful worship service. Uh, thank you, Pastor Rob. Um, as we begin, I would just like uh, Lynn to open us in prayer, and then we'll start on our lesson, which is the grieving lesson. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, are grateful that you are with us, and uh, we just invite you to open our hearts and our minds as we share today, uh, especially about uh, people who are, are hurting or are grieving. You know about pain, and you are with us in our pain, and we are, are grateful for that. Help us, Lord, as we share with one another uh, about how we can be of help. And uh, we ask that you would use this time to shape us and mold us to be ones who can be of help in the midst of grief, and that people will feel your hand upon their hearts as they are healing from their grief. Lead us today and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, before we move on to this lesson of grieving, um, I left you with the challenge to think about some artwork, some artistic uh, representation of what it means to experience suffering, wounds of the heart, would anyone like to either share your artwork or share what it was like if you did this exercise? If so, if you feel comfortable, um, unmute and uh, share with us as a group. If you're not, that's okay too. Anyone like to share? Yeah, did anyone do it? <laughs> it was optional. <laughs> it was optional, and it was just encouragement. Uh, but if we do this lesson as a, a training, or if you're part of a group in the future, uh, this is an exercise that is part of that experience. So I don't want to cut anyone off, but... If not, then we will move ahead. So the, the lesson is what happens when someone is grieving today? And our objectives are to really recognize the different stages of grief. And this is different from what you might have learned with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross or other grieving lessons that you have had. Then discussing how well, how to respond to grieving um, as we process it in our lives and in the lives of others. And at the last part is a tool uh, called Lament, and that is uh, something that we've shared with the Stephen ministers in the past, but also is a tool that helps us as we're processing grief. So I'm going to share uh, my screen uh, quickly for one slide. To remind us that we are on the arc of trauma healing and we have discussed suffering. If God loves us, why do we suffer? Last week, talked about being heard. And today we are grieving and lamenting. So this is the next step in the process of healing the wounds of our hearts. So as we begin, I'm going to just paraphrase a story because our lessons generally would start with a story that then allows us to think about people's experiences in the midst of grief. So this story is called The Night That Changed Tony's Life. 
Now, Tony was a teenager in high school and he shared a one bedroom apartment with his single mother and two younger brothers. He worked part time at a pizza place and went to school and had goals of making a good life for himself and his family after high school. He worked hard to stay out of trouble and to avoid the gangs that so many of his friends had joined. One night, Tony had an extra shift at the pizza place and got home late. As he got home, he could see that something had happened in front of his home. A terrible battle had broken out between two gangs his mother and younger brothers were on their way home and his younger brother had been shot and killed immediately. And his other brother, Joe, was seriously wounded and taken to the hospital. Tony knew that it was something terrible that had happened, but he wasn't sure. And as he got into the quiet apartment, he listened to a recording of his mother's shaky voice telling him what had happened and to come to the hospital. Now, weeks later, his youngest brother, Joe, was able to get back to the house in a wheelchair. They had had a small funeral for his youngest brother weeks before. Tony's grief began to overwhelm him. He found himself crying when he least expected it, and he was so embarrassed, especially at school. He didn't want to go anymore. He was trying to hold his feelings in. He wasn't sleeping well. He even got an F on an algebra test, and that was not something that he had done before. His thoughts of guilt and grief were always with him, and he began to think about how he could get back at the gang members who had destroyed their lives. Tony's mom was so withdrawn that she couldn't even take care of the younger sons. Everyone began to shout, and neighbors grew concerned as there was lots of disruption within the family of Tony's life. We see that Tony, Joe, and his mother all experienced different things in the grieving of this young son. And I think that it starts our lesson with the understanding that everyone has their own experience of grief. And we'll talk about that as we go through this lesson this morning. Um, I'd like to ask, I knew, knew two people who have a Bible within maybe arm's length of where you're sitting. Any, does anyone have one? I see Myrna, you've got one. Anybody else? Okay, Mary, you've got one. Okay, uh, Myrna, could you look up uh, Nehemiah 1, verses 3 and 4? And Mary, if you could uh, look up 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. So, uh, grieving. So what is it? It's grieving is a feeling of deep sorrow about a loss a loss of someone or loss of something. Um, so it has to do with loss. And I'd like to just put forth the question to you to unmute and just put out uh, what kind of losses do we grieve? What, what are the kinds of things that uh, human beings experience that when they lose, lose something that they might grieve about? Loss of spouse or child. So loss of a, a loved one. Yeah. A loved one, parent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What loss else? of mobility. Mobility. Yeah. Whether that may be your body, uh, like illness or injury, or even loss of 
maybe you lose your transportation method. Yeah, yeah what else? Loss of, uh, I was going to say, job or friendship and home. Okay. Job, uh, position, something that you did for your work, uh, maybe, uh, or uh, a friendship, yes, loss of a friendship. The person may not have died, but uh, may moved away or or gone. Yeah. Loss of, loss of independence, something of concern for elderly people who, you know, may have lived alone and all of a sudden they're faced with children taking over and saying, no, you can't be alone anymore. <laughs> Life has changed. Yes, indeed. Yes. Margaret, you had a hand up. I was just thinking about our first experiences of loss as children and how we how we um, that forms perhaps as we how we deal with loss ongoing. So it can be loss of a friend. I mean, I'm thinking about kids in elementary school and junior high and all the trauma that goes on during those periods of time and and kids with pets and losing a pet, losing a grandparent, all of those things that I think really form um, how we how we deal with things later on. Indeed. Yes. Children, children experience loss, indeed. Yeah. Going to mention divorce, maybe divorce. equally as uh, severe as a, a death of a spouse. Right. So divorce can can be an ongoing loss. Yeah. About uh, uh, maybe the a cultural loss, a loss of the way we think things work that uh, we, we uh, are saddened by what we perceive to be the losses of our youth and, and the culture that was involved with that. Okay, thank you. Cultural loss, and loss of the way, the way we used to live. So also, that. sorry. I was just going to add also loss of mental cognitive ability. In this day and age, you know, people are concerned they're going to lose their uh, their brain, and uh, that, that's a big concern. That's a major one, <clears throat> along with loss of use of other body parts and functions and all, uh, but, but not being able to think and express yourself or remember is difficult. Yeah, Mark, Margaret. I was also thinking when you were talking about cultural loss, um, as our society changes, um, I, I think there's also a feeling of loss of communities that you're in and how those communities change and the loss of how things always have been and and not being able to adapt very well to what may be happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as an extension of that, um, even when people choose to move, a uh, loss of community um, in that respect and that they're not in the same neighborhood, but also in this time of COVID, we have lost a lot of connections, personal connections um, that I think is an underlying severe loss for many. Ooh, yes, loss of connection. And of course, a, an obvious one, a loss of property. Um, your house burned down. Um, or somebody stole something valuable or you know, your car was in a wreck, your life was spared, but your, your car was lost, your favorite car. Or, <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> with some of these things that we've talked about loss uh, not loss of job but loss of abilities as, as Pastor Rob mentioned that maybe your body isn't functioning but, or, or our minds that we're, loss of ability to do something that we really like a hobby that we enjoy uh, we can't do any so many of these things will also add up to loss of dreams or hopes that we have for the future, maybe for ourselves, maybe for our, our children or people that we love. And 
and there is even one which we'll allude to a little bit in just a moment, <clears throat> loss of identity, uh, who, who we are. Um, but whether large or small, losses definitely affect us as human beings and grieving is the normal process of recovering from these losses. Uh, in the past lesson, we mentioned the difference between grief and trauma. Um, trauma always involves loss, but is usually, as we mentioned, I think, in the convening session, is usually accompanied either by um, horror or uh, hopelessness, helplessness, or a sense of intense fear. But we can experience loss without trauma, uh, as in the slow death of an elderly parent. But as we see from the screen, um, uh, all, all traumas involve loss, but not all losses uh, are necessarily uh, considered trauma. Um, now, I mentioned identity as a loss. You know, if when people lose someone or something that's very, very important to them, that the person who, who loses this also lose a part of who they are. They lose a part of that identity. They, they used to be some, this person's spouse. They used to be this person's uh, child or this person's parent, but now that, that person is no longer there. So not only did they lose the person, they, they lost a part of their, their identity in relation to that person. And so uh, their life, even their life, will never be the same again. And through the grieving process, a person's sense of who they are will change. I mean, actually, you know, it changes you. You are now going to be a different person in some way because of this loss. And this whole process takes time. So I, I'd like to, if I could, I think it was Myrna who had the, the Nehemiah verse. Uh, Myrna, would you read uh, Nehemiah 1, verse 3 to 4? Yes. As I looked it over, it looks like it's talking about the people that survived not being captured. Yes. They replied, the survivors there in the province who escaped captivity are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Thank you. This is the show is Nehemiah in the midst of, of uh being in Babylon and hearing of uh, just how much has been lost. Um, and so it, it shows that this is a, a normal process. It, it's, it's people certainly experience biblical times as well as now. Uh, but then uh, thankfully, uh, as Christians, we can grieve and have hope at the same time. And uh, uh, if I could ask you, uh, Mary, to read 1 Thessalonians 4.13. 1 Thessalonians 4, did you say 13? Yes. Now, brothers, we want you to know the truth about those who have died. Otherwise, you might become sad the way other people do when you have nothing to hope for. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that in the same way God, through Jesus, will take with him those who have died. So thank you. So we're talking about how uh, people can, in fact, uh, we do, as Christians, we do have a hope uh, that we can hold to, but it doesn't mean we don't grieve. We grieve, uh, but thankfully we have a reason to hope.
So I'm sorry, I, I seem to have lost the ability to stop screen sh sharings, but I'm going to move us to this diagram before I ask Patty to take us off of this screen share. Um, as we look at grieving, we want to see how we can grieve in a way that brings healing. It takes lots of time and energy, and it often is like a journey that takes us through several neighborhoods. When we were in Africa doing the training, we used uh, taking us through different villages. Either way, it's looking at different parts of what we would call a grief journey. The first one after our major crisis or loss, we might meet neighborhood one, a neighborhood of denial and anger. Then after some time, we may go to a neighborhood of no hope. And if the healing process begins, then we are able to move into the neighborhood of new beginnings. So Patty, would you try stopping my screen sharing because it's not allowing me to stop it? I seem to have lost meeting controls for some reason. <laughs> it must be my computer more than anything. I'm not sure. I have it set for only the host to be able to share but I can't seem to change it from that. That's what's so strange about this. So um, let me see here. It doesn't give me any other, uh, it just says one participant can share at a time or multiple and it's marked for one and it's marked for host. But go, go to Patty and make her host for the minute and then she can do it. Well, I am a co-host. Oh, yeah, I but I, I can't yeah. find a way to, to stop it. Patty, so uh, let me try. I think. Okay, I'll, Rob, do it. Let me see if I can do it. That's not letting me do it either. Oh. <laughs> so are you still seeing us or not? Yes. Yes, okay. because we can't see you for some reason, things have changed. But either way, um, when we're talking about uh, the slide on the grief journey, what we're looking at first is the neighborhood of denial and anger. And in the process of this, it often will take us um, more than a month or maybe six months to go through this process of the neighborhood of denial and anger. It's said that right after a loss, denier and, denial and anger are natural and can actually be helpful. Denial allows us to absorb the loss little by little and keeps us from being overwhelmed. Anger can be a way of fighting against the loss when we feel helpless. It can give us energy and keep us from being overwhelmed. Mm. So think about your own experiences of losses. Can you think about how people might respond in this neighborhood of denial and anger? If, since I can't see you, if you can uh, uh, just speak up, if there are responses. I don't know if this is considered denial or anger, but um, someone I know uh, lost their mother that they had kind of been taking care of. Um, the mother was in a nursing home, uh, had dementia, um, and because of COVID, you know, uh, was unable to see her. Uh, for part of the year, but towards the end was able to, um, but she took care of her mom, 
her mom had lived her mom's house uh oh now my screen is fixed i don't I, it's everyone i can see but anyway um her mother passed away kind of unexpectedly um she had just moved her in the week before to a new nursing home and then all of a sudden she got a call that her mom was in the emergency room and um somehow she had some kind of infection and she ended up dying like two days later and um i was surprised with how this person returned back to uh work uh at at such a short time but she said a comment to me which has kind of stuck with me she's like i don't think this will hit me for another month or so uh and she goes i just haven't had time because she's she had a saw now she's in the process of her mom's house. She had to call family and friends at the spur of the moment. You know, do they do some kind of memorial with COVID and all this stuff? And she was like, I don't think it's hit me yet. I it's gonna probably hit me in the next three to six months. Thank you, Mary. I think that's so true. I read something this morning in the New York Times. They have said that one in three people in the United States have been impacted by COVID with the loss of a friend or family member. And that's what we're experiencing and seeing it constantly. If the funeral cannot occur, uh, where people can come in and share in the grieving process, it's taking longer. People are deferring memorial services. How is that impacting what we might consider a normal grieving journey? So thank you, Mary, for sharing. Any other well, also on that COVID thing, maybe not so much losing your parent or you know your parent, but your parent is in the nursing home where you were unable to go visit and losing that sense of touch. You know, she told me one time it was like three weeks before she even kissed her mom, and when she did kiss her mom, she had to do it behind uh, you know something so the staff wouldn't see. You know, and that kind of loss. So yeah, her mom was still alive and everything. But the loss of, 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 of touching. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Other and yes, I found a way to get rid of your screen. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. much better to look at uh, your faces. <laughs> so I was thinking about the perspective of refugees who have multiple, multiple losses simultaneously. And you know, if they're in a refugee camp, they wouldn't have privacy, wouldn't have health care. There's so many things that have been taken from them. And yet they might be dealing with massive grief of, you know, seeing loved ones killed before their eyes, you know, so many things. And then to live in that situation, sometimes for decades, I'm involved with a, um, a refugee ministry here in Worcester. And the family from the Congo uh, that I'm friends with now, they um, were in the same camp for 20 years. The husband and wife met there. They brought to this country 12-year-old twins that were born you know, in the refugee camp. So anyway, there wouldn't be a chance to grieve. <laughs> No, basic survival is what most of them have to focus on at that point. And, you know, I think that's where we all have had to learn how to work through this COVID pandemic. I think of refugees and others. I know in Uganda, they had, to, they locked down completely. They could not even travel into town uh, from the camps. So they're very hard things that people have dealt with. Other common responses to this tragic loss or um, a grief that they're experiencing? Margaret? It's, it's, well, it's just, it's just making me think a little bit that is grieving, uh, I hate to use it, well, I'm just gonna say this word, but is grieving actually in a way a luxury because when you're in a in a very ongoing experience, I'm thinking even in this country, you know, if you look at um, our, our descendants who were 
you know, living day to day, trying to survive. I mean, it's happening today. There's no allowance to really go to grieve because you have to get right back out there and deal with what's going on. So um, that block of being able to grieve is, has been there for, for many, many people and is ongoing. Yeah, I've never thought about it being a luxury, but it is something that God desires for us to do. And um, people may not view it as an important process in life, how you develop the resilience to keep moving through the challenges of grief and loss. But that's an important point, um, Margaret. You know, some people will experience total numbness they're, they're completely taken away from their normal reality when something tragic happens. They may burst out in anger and crying. And this is what was happening to Tony, a teenage boy who had been taught that he shouldn't cry. That he shouldn't uh, be embarrassed in front of his friends in that way. And uh, many people will have regrets they will think that if they were there or if they had done something else, it wouldn't have resulted in the death or the loss of the loved one. So this stage, the first neighborhood of denial and anger is a challenging one. And most people will say that it, if it's processed with the help of others, it may last one to six months. Obviously, there is no way to put a time to it, but that would be a common um, uh, duration of this period of being in a neighborhood of denial and anger. At a certain point on the journey, though, there is going to tend, tend to be the visit to the next neighborhood, which is the neighborhood of no hope. Um, this is often, not always, but often it, it lasts from six to 15 months or so, and although it can be different, of course, for each person. Now, this indeed is the darkest place in the grieving journey, and I would like to ask you all to, how would you describe what you would think uh, people who are in this neighborhood of no hope what are they, what are they, how are they looking? What are they thinking about? How are they, they feeling or doing? I just want to open it up to ask you, uh, people with no hope, what are they, what, what do they look like and what are they doing and thinking? Question whether they actually want to go on living. Ah, yes, do they want to live. Sorry, we have a preponderance of negative thinking and looking at the, the potential disasters around the corner and instead of the possibility of something returning to a better place. Really not thinking that something good could ever happen again uh, is, is a thought. Uh, that maybe everything is going to be negative and feel this way forever. I think isolation and withdrawal can be common reactions. Yeah. And I do feel like the timetable to um, one's reaction can relate to the, the crisis, if it was anticipated or if it was sudden. Indeed. That, that, there are things that can make it even worse. Yes, Paul. Another, um, another example might be someone living with a spouse who's... Uh, no longer the person that uh, he or she might have been in a debilitating long illness or particularly in the case of dementia. Uh, I think that it prolongs this great period of helplessness and certainly can generate even feelings of anger of why can't this end though then being guilty that uh, such thoughts might arise. An ongoing law, it just doesn't seem to end. And you know, so that certainly generates this no hope and yeah. feeling of hopelessness. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think that sometimes you have to let uh, people do that, um, have that hopelessness. Uh, of course, you have to be careful with how far they take it. But, you know, uh, 
I'll just use myself as an example. After one of my marathons, I hurt my knee and couldn't walk. And I thought the pain was going to last forever. And I went to doctors and they said, do this and that, this and that. And I did, and it still wasn't painful. I'm like, I'm never going to be able to walk normal again. And have someone say, yeah, but at least you have two arms. Or at least you have, you know, uh, you know. It's sometimes it's like, let me for this one day, just sit here and pity myself so I can just get it out and just like, let me just complain. And then tomorrow I'll make sure I'm thankful for the two arms that I do have, you know. But I do sometimes think it's, at least for me, I sometimes want to let me have that hopelessness feeling for like one day or one hour where I can just say what I want to say about why I feel negative. Although I realize I have other blessings and that's just one thing out of other things, but it's just allow that person to maybe have that hopeless, you know, anyway. Indeed. I, I think we should. <laughs> and I think to sort of mirror their feeling, yeah, you have had a terrific loss. It is awful. And I just want to walk alongside you um, yeah. rather than si trying to distract them mm -hmm. from that. You're affirming, you're affirming that what I know it must be real. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Indeed. And certainly the, the sadness, the, the loneliness, if you've lost a loved one, uh, that, that can, can really cause you to want to escape or avoid um, these things. Some people get into, as we talked about before, escapism may take the form of sleep, or it could take the form of substance abuse, could even take the form of... of uh, work, I mean, over overworking or, or something like that, something to get their mind off or away from, uh, from whatever it is that, that they have lost. And, and, and there may even be this feeling, you know, of just remaining in that wanting something to change that isn't going to change. It, it's, it's gonna something, and so you remain wanting the change and, and you're, you could get stuck there if, if remaining there a long time. But I guess just after we've shared all of this, I think it's just important to point out as has been mentioned that being in the neighborhood of no hope with all of the feelings that come with it is normal. It is a normal part of grieving and, and indeed we need to allow people to to experience that. Now, people might see something that reminds them of the situation or the loss or the incident, and they may go back to the neighborhood of denial and anger, stay there for a while, and then come back again to uh, the neighborhood of, of no hope. So there can be some movement back and forth between these neighborhoods. And then if you remember on the grief journey, um, the third neighborhood is the neighborhood of new beginnings. And slowly, people may begin to have a glimmer of hope. They may increasingly accept the loss that they've experienced, and they begin to see a new identity. They begin to see something that they might call the new normal. And we've been hearing that a lot after this pandemic, people talking about the new normal. I think it is something that's reality after you've had a major trauma, uh, tragedy, and loss, that you begin to experience something that allows you to start looking to the future. Um, what does that look like in a person's life? When do you, if you're walking with a friend or a family member and they begin to experience this, what might you hear or what might they say? Have you, I'm sure that you have ex walked through grief with others. Uh, just share the common responses to this movement from the neighborhood of no hope to the neighborhood of new beginnings. Can anyone share? I just remember 
after the death of my husband. And my numb, dumb state lasted about two and a half years. But when I finally reached the point where I wanted to help someone else, there was somebody in the hospital suffering with cancer who was a friend and I wanted to go visit her and, and help her. So I think being able to get out of yourself and your problem and uh, be willing to uh, do something for others. Thank you, Jan. That's a very important uh, part of this looking at something future, looking at your identity in a new way. Anything else? Some people, Sharon, um, in this loss kind of circumstance, uh, do that sort of, uh, I, I wish I could call, you know, so-and-so. I wish I could be in that person's presence. And that is that recognition of loss. But as they move through that, they realize that that person hasn't, you know, left them completely, that, that they can still talk to that person. They can still remember that, tell stories, you know, be with other people who had that, uh, you know, some of those same experiences. And, and so they start to move away from that um, grief, uh, that no hope. Yes, it's not the same, but now it's just different. Uh, and and that, that's a really neat thing to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chad. I was just, um, I, I, I was divorced and I think for, for me, part of it was the self-blame and um, uh, just feeling like I wasn't as good as anybody else kind of thing. So the community, particularly St. Andrew community, having, being in a community of people where they, they look at you and accept you for who you are, um, I think it does a lot to help um, engender that a hope a hope in a person and a sense of self-value. Thank you, Margaret. And I know when my father died, uh, I tried to think of happy things to talk to my mother about. And we were overseas. She was here in the States and I would write letters about funny things my children did and on and on and on. And after about six months, she said, have you forgotten your father? You haven't talked about him. And you know, you've said nothing about him. So I think they that after a loss, the person suffering most sometimes does want to not avoid the loss, but talk about it or talk about that person. Thank you. That's very, very true, Jan. And I think people who are uncomfortable. Uh, with that may not be the ones to walk alongside them. <laughs> They're not the ones uh, at that moment because people do need to be able to comfortably talk about that person uh, or that thing that they have lost. Thank you. I, th I think uh, <clears throat> anniversaries are a good opportunity to establish a new beginning. Uh, Christmas, uh, birthday, uh, the date of the death and that sort of thing that it helps the person who may be still grieving to realize, oh, maybe I'm, I'm done and, and there are new beginnings and I can celebrate what was and celebrate what is to be. That's very good, Paul. Thank you. This I'm letter reminds Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Beth. But I, I understood your question to be what what um, behaviors do you observe in people that are coming out of the loss, and I, I think that it's often a, um, a a statement or an action that the grieving person has that they're trying something new, or they're <laughs> saying, "I'm starting to feel alive again in some way." They're taking initiative. Excellent. That's true. Mm -hmm. And speaking of, she said, taking initiative. I know for two years after Larry died, I was, I couldn't plan any 
social, you know, call a friend to go to lunch or anything like that. I was just in this numb state and I was so grateful for groups of friends who just said, we're going to go out for pizza every Wednesday. Will you meet us after you finish work, you know, over for pizza? Or um, we're going to pick you up and go for coffee and breakfast every Saturday morning because those were hard mornings with no definite goal. I didn't have to be at work. I didn't have church. So Saturdays were the rough days. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that uh, friends who really know you can start seeing those little signs that you're ready for them. And going socially is a, an important step. Some people will actually start thinking if their spouse died that they might want to have a, a friend that's a man or a woman. <laughs> and they may decide that they want to remarry. They may decide to have a child after they've lost a child. So there are many steps that bring this new beginning. People are different than they were before the crisis, but they are seeing the potential of moving onward. And the grief journey is not direct. As Lynn said before, we move between these. If you have an anniversary, you may go back to that feeling of no hope, but then you can move more quickly into the the neighborhood of new beginnings. If someone gets stuck in a neighborhood of no hope or even denial and anger and cannot move beyond that, then they may need professional help. And that's just like we would say with Stephen Ministry and what we talked about last lesson as well. So what if uh, a different disaster or trauma strikes uh, someone and a helper comes along and says something like, oh, don't be angry or don't be sad. Or uh, if you trust God, you can feel happy right now and you can just kind of resume your life as if, as if nothing happened. Is that likely to uh, be helpful or work? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Not likely at all. Uh, to work because because the healing has not taken place and, and the opportunity. Sometimes we think that if we believe the gospel and all the promises of God, it would be wrong to feel angry or sad about a loss. And our culture might even reinforce that. Uh, but we would call doing something like this the false bridge because it appears to provide a straight path from the moment of loss straight to the neighborhood of new beginnings. And uh, this is not biblical. It's not, uh, it's it certainly will not bring healing at all because, because God made us with a need to grieve our losses. Even Jesus grieved on the cross. He, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, the psalmist crying in the night just you know, he's crying. When when will I see your face? My tears have been my food day and night. Facing all of the the pain of loss though takes courage, and we are tempted sometimes to avoid it by taking the false bridge. And sometimes we we get busy doing work, maybe even God's work, as as a way to avoid feeling the pain. But if we do not grieve the loss, the grief will stay in us and it may cause problems for us for many years to come. We would normally show the, uh, the false bridge over the grief journey villages, but since we had such troubles with sharing the screens last time, I won't do that. But when we're talking about grieving, what can make it more difficult? It's often the type of loss. Uh, grieving is hard and it's very difficult for, for everyone. But if there are many deaths, say a tragedy within a town or a community where there are multiple deaths, that makes it especially difficult to grieve. 
where there is a sudden loss, an accident, tragic accident, or a suicide, that is often much more difficult to grieve for the family and for the community. If there's no corpse to be buried, we're hearing a lot on news about old cases and family members being asked when they are not actually able to bury their loved one, it extends the grieving process. And if they're displaced, which the COVID has been the perfect example of that, if families have not been able to travel and to celebrate the life of their loved one, that can make this much more difficult as well. We talked last time about crying or weeping and culturally that can vary. And if you remember the story of Job where Job's three friends went to try to comfort him after he lost everything. Uh, this section is called the miserable comforters. We can be that miserable comforter to another if we think we've got the answers. And what we as fellow Christians, as friends uh, and family, we don't we should not be that miserable comforter, actually be someone who can walk alongside the person that is grieving. So as we uh, um, move through this journey, everyone's a bit different, and yet we want to have the love that God has given us to share with others. So time is getting near to the end. I just want to bring to uh, your attention once again, if you have not heard of lament, this is the normal end to this grieving lesson, where we talk about bringing our pain to God through a lament. And for those who heard this uh, with a Stephen ministry training, perhaps you've had the opportunity to write a lament. I would challenge you even more than the artwork lesson of last week to think about what it would be for you to pour out your hearts to God in what you're experiencing now. Many people have multiple wounds to their hearts, and it may require several uh, laments for you to really pour out what you're feeling and experiencing. But this is a tool that God has given us to express our grief. And if you look in the Psalms, many of us, I think, are attracted to studying the Psalms because indeed, more than 60 of them are laments. They help us to identify with people of God, and we are experiencing their grief when we read these psalms. A lament can be composed by an individual, and I know with our racial uh, um, justice, just our act justly racial inequality discussion group on Tuesday nights. We're not talking just about individual lament, but we're talking about community lament as we look at um, much of the injustice that is has occurred within our country. And so lament is a powerful tool and um, I'm thankful that we've been challenged to do that even within our worship services over the last several Sundays and beyond. Lament is often made up of seven parts, addressing God, reviewing God's faithfulness in the past, a complaint, a confession of sin or claim of innocence, a request for help, God's response, and a vow to praise or trust God. And I'll have these in the outline for the lesson that is posted on the website. Good. The important part of this is the complaint. 
they say it doesn't even need to contain anything more but the complaint. It's pouring out grief and loss to God. Sometimes we get angry with God. We may actually uh, feel like um, he has caused the loss or grief that we're experiencing. And yet as we pour out our, our losses and our grief, God is big enough to hear it all. So uh, that's the important part of lament. We don't try to solve our problem in the course of it. We just acknowledge that God is the one that's in control and that God will take action to bring justice rather than us taking action ourselves. So some communities of faith use lament regularly. Perhaps you are one of those that grew up in that kind of community. But many of us, this is a newer practice. And so I would challenge you to, to think about what you might want to pour out to God and write it down. You don't need to share it with us, but perhaps you would feel comfortable sharing it with a friend or a loved one. And as we finish our lesson, I'm, I'm going to suggest that I read to you uh, Psalm 13. It's one of the many laments from the Psalms that David writes, and it really, pour, it, we experience him as we listen to the words that he wrote in Psalm 13. So uh, close your eyes if you're comfortable and hear the words of King David. How much longer will you forget me, Lord, forever? How much longer will you hide yourself from me? How long must I endure trouble? How long will sorrow fill my heart day and night? How long will my enemies triumph over me? Look at me, O Lord my God, and answer me. Restore my strength. Don't let me die. Don't let my enemies say we have defeated him. Don't let them gloat over my downfall. I rely on your constant love, O oh God. I will be glad because you will rescue me. I will sing to you, O oh Lord, because you have been good to me. Amen. So that is the basic lesson of grieving and lament. And uh, if we were in small group or in a training session, you would experience much of this as a personal experience going through it. As we look to the next lesson, it is a lesson of taking the pain to the cross, take, taking your pain to the cross as a step of leading to healing and rebuilding and resilience. So I think this exercise of writing a lament is a first step to that beginning to recognize what wounds you might have in your heart and then allowing yourself to lament before and with God. Are there any immediate questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us again today. And we'll move on to the next lesson next week. I think you were going to pray for us. Thank you. Let's pray. 
Lord, we, we give thanks to you that you never leave us nor forsake us, even in what appears to be our darkest time. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for standing by us, and thank you that we can reach out to you at any time, that we can share with you whatever is on our hearts, and that you are, are welcome, you welcome us to, to letting you know what we're really, really feeling. Help us to be willing to do that, not just in the times of grief, but throughout every day that you give us. Help us to be ready to, to have that close of a connection with you as we walk. And we pray that we will do that as we walk through this new week until you bring us back together again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.